Good morning, Brother Joe. Good morning, coaches. Uh, thank you so much again for the opportunity. I thank Pastor Scott, of course, uh, for giving me the privilege of speaking again this morning. You know, Joe just said about the weapon curriculum, you're going to be able to take the curriculum and you're going to be able to use the curriculum. Take and use. Those are action words. In other words, it's not enough to have the curriculum. <laughs> it's not enough to maybe even have read the curriculum or maybe to have uh, gone through the curriculum with uh, your brothers uh, maybe two times or three times like we have at House on the Rock Church. You have to actually take the curriculum <laughs> for yourself uh, and use the curriculum because the principles that God has given Pastor Scott and the Ministry of Mental Discipleship Network that are in the weapons curriculum are powerful tools. They're powerful weapons. And you know why I can say that? Because I've never seen a curriculum uh, with, with so much of the word of God as I have seen with the weapons curriculum and that is very fitting to be called weapons and to make sure that it isn't a book of advice but it is a book that uses the ultimate weapon uh, that sword the word of god uh, to help you to not only do battle but even to allow that word to cut away things in your own life uh, that need to be dealt with. And so I'm so thankful for, of course, the word of God, which means I can be thankful for the weapons curriculum, which contains so much of the word of God. And we've been talking over the last couple of weeks, the importance of not leaving the word, not leaving this curriculum, not leaving your weapon on the shelf. But taking it as Joe instructed us and using it. And so this morning, uh, we're going to go through some of the charts that are in the weapons curriculum. We did that last week, uh, last week with SEAL Team, last week with the Power of Four, maybe even one or two others we touched upon. And this morning, I want to dive right in to talking about that word, just as an introduction, word of God, collision, Jesus and the word. And we read in Matthew uh, 4, 4, 7, 10, this phrase that Jesus uses while he's being tempted in the desert. He says, it is written, referring of course to the very words that God has spoken. He says in Matthew 19, 4, have you not read? And so these are verses that are very strong indicators that Jesus valued the word of God, the written word of God. Matthew 22, 29, your mistake is that you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. And I'm so thankful that the word of God is alive and it is active and that it is a powerful weapon uh, that is not a carnal weapon, right? But it actually is effective and it is powerful. And so there are three benefits of owning scripture. We have uh, the answers that come from the word of God. We have the fact that his word astounds us powerfully. You ever read something three, four, five, a hundred times, and all of a sudden, the Lord just enlightens you in your spirit in a way that you have not read it before. He assists us through the word. And as we fill in these blanks this morning, he answers questions in your head. The who. He astounds and motivates your heart. 
the why, and he assists and equips your hands, the what. And so the word of God is so essential that it would be virtually impossible to walk out this Christian life as a man of God as a son of God, as a soldier of God, as a priest within our households, as a leader in our community, as a, as a uh, powerful catalyst for the great things God wants to do in his kingdom, even through your church, without the word of God. And so I looked at the scriptures in Luke and Mark that talk about uh, Jesus, you know, being tempted. And I want to read that for you this morning. If from the gospel of Luke chapter four, there are three things about the Holy Spirit that the writer of the gospels tells us about this interaction with the enemy, Satan, that Jesus had in the desert while he's being tempted or surrounded just before, just after uh, that temptation. Chapter four of Luke, verse one, it says, Jesus full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus full of the Holy Spirit. And so number one this morning, it is vital to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It goes on to say he left the Jordan and was led by the Holy Spirit. It is vital, man of God, to not only be full of the Holy Spirit, but to be led by the Holy Spirit. In this case, into a situation that didn't seem positive. Listen to the rest of the story. Into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Temptation number one. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Temptation number two. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. And that concludes temptation number three. But listen to the last verse. You might miss it if you're reading your Bible based on the headlines, because this next verse is really Many would think part of the next story where Jesus is rejected in Nazareth, but it's really concluding this story where Jesus is tempted in the desert. It says in verse 14, listen carefully, not only was Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, not only was he led by the Holy Spirit, it says Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit in the power of the spirit and so i read in this story not only was jesus 
able to use scripture as a weapon while being tempted. But there is this other thread throughout this story, and that is the Holy Spirit. Men, we need the word. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And boy, oh boy, I need to be full of, led by, and in the power of the Holy Spirit too. Maybe you've seen that meme before. It says people are debating about needing the Holy Spirit. And it goes on to say, I don't need the Holy Spirit just to live life. Man, I need the Holy Spirit just to go to Walmart. <laughs> we need the Holy Spirit. We need the power of God working and operating in our lives. Jesus was able to overcome pleasing himself physically, in this case with food, in our case with food, but also with a dozen other things that typically plague at a man's spirit, if not tamed, if not done the way the word of God says is acceptable. Jesus needed to be filled with, led by, and the power of to overcome temptation, even in his flesh, in temptation number one. And in temptation number two, Jesus needed the Holy Spirit in order to overcome the enemy and recognize that worship belonged to God, his father, and to God alone, not to bring anything else as an idol. And men, I need to be full of, led by, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, not only not to gratify the lust of my flesh, but not to build idols in my life where I'm worshiping other things and not allowing God to be on the throne of my heart, of my life. And then Jesus needed the Holy Spirit full of, led by, and the power of in this third temptation where he says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, there was a temptation to forgo the purpose that God had for Jesus. And I need that Holy Spirit being filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, in the power of the Holy Spirit, not to settle for second best, but to live out the calling and the purpose that God has for my life. Men, how about you this morning? Do you need to be led by the Holy Spirit today? Do you this morning need to be full of the Holy Spirit today? Do you need to be in the power of the Holy Spirit today? We are living in a culture that has a lot of influence on the church and it's a sad reality because the truth is god ordained the church to have a greater influence on the world than the world has on the church and i believe it's because men we're settling for something less than being full of, led by, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this pyramid that is in our weapons curriculum that talks about culture's influence, underneath that pyramid, it gives us a description of culture, the beliefs, the attitudes, the behavioral characteristics of a particular social group, the customs, the arts, the school of thought, moral standards, and goodwill towards one another. Brother, do you have a biblical perspective or do you have a worldly perspective? What is guiding 
your life? Is it the word of God and the power of God through the Holy Spirit? Or is it what the television is telling you? Or is it what the magazines or the people of influence, the Jeff Bezos and the Elon Musks of the world are telling us? Association, the next word, an organized group of people who have the same interest, job, the process of forming mental connections or bonds between sensations, ideas, or memories. This idea in the Greek of mixing parts. Who are you mixing with and who are you allowing to be mixed in with you? There's a real beautiful thing about men of God coming together to serve the Lord, to grow in the word of the Lord, like we are here this morning. I love when I went to prepare for Hope Day that I saw Brother Sonny there and, and, and some of the other brothers there, and, and there they were helping to pack food, helping to pack trucks. And I thought, there, there's my boys from MDN Thursday mornings. Praise God. Hallelujah. And I know they looked at me in the van and said, there's Pastor Gary. Hallelujah. Growing in the word, growing in the service of the Lord. Man, that's the type of, of influence we want with one another. Permission, the right or ability to think a certain way or to do something that is given by someone who has the power to decide if it will be allowed or permitted. Man, you know what I tell some of the brothers at our church and some of the brothers that I work with through Brooklyn Teen Challenge, sometimes they're tempted to do something they shouldn't do, tempted to leave the program prematurely. And I say, you know what? There are men who love you, who've been around you, who've invested in your life. And what you need to do right now, because you're not thinking correctly, you're being maybe led by your emotions, you're being led by, by, by the negative things that have taken place in your life or your, your, your flesh that wants to go out there and just fulfill its desires. You can't make these choices by yourself. I encourage you that you don't make a major life decision without speaking to one of these brothers that have invested in your life without consulting with your pastor, without consulting with your director of Brooklyn Teen Challenge, without talking to your SEAL team. And the truth is that we don't want to share with those that are over us or those that we call our friends or our brothers, if we don't wanna share with them what our plans are, it's probably because our plans we know are not the ones we should be carrying out. And that should be a big indicator that we don't even go forward in that area. Man, let's have a culture of association that submits one to another because we trust our brothers that they have a true love and our best interest in mind. And the truth is if we're not willing to submit to them, it's probably a greater indicator that we're not willing to submit to God. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and the last one, believe, to accept or regard something as true, to accept the truth of what is said by someone. And that's where we get this idea from. Where do you get your truth from? What do you believe? What are you living out? Because your belief is not necessarily what you say. It's how you live. And the culture, your association, the permission, what you believe will ultimately lead, lead to how you live your life and what you allow to influence your life. And when you experience the life of, of Christ, when you experience the truth through your, your veins, through your spirit, 
of the life of God, man, then it begins to work the opposite way. You take that life of Christ and it impacts the way others believe and it impacts the way others are able to submit it. It impacts the way others are able to have good relationships and it influences ultimately the culture, at least that's around you. And we get so caught up sometimes as Christians talking about the state of the world or the state of the country that we're not realizing God wants us to influence the people that are right around us. And if you can change the hearts of those closest to you, we'd be on a course to changing our city, our state, our nation, and the world. This morning, guys, I want to end by touching upon one more chart in our weapons curriculum. And it's the well-ordered man. And then I want to share with you a, a story of what took place in our church this week. Um, and then pray in closing. A well-ordered man. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. You will guard him and keep him in perfect and constant peace, whose mind is stayed on you. Because he commits himself to you, leans on you, and hopes confidently in you. Men, you want the peace. I know it. That's the number one thing I hear any human being say as a pastor. All I want, they say, is peace. And the word says, constant peace. And the word says, perfect peace. Man, that sounds good, doesn't it? All I want is perfect and constant peace. But look at all of the things that are done by the man who gets the guarantee of perfect and constant peace. His mind is stayed on God. He commits himself to God. He leans on God. He hopes confidently in God. And if I'm honest with myself this morning, there are days I'm not committed. It reminds me of this uh, story of the pig and I believe, uh, you know, I'm not a farmer, the pig and the chicken. They're going past a fair and there's this fundraiser going on and it talks about donations for the food for the fundraiser. And the chicken says, well, come on, let's go donate. I'll be the egg and you can be the bacon. And the pig says, well, for you, that's a contribution. For me, that's a commitment. <laughs> Have you been just contributing to the things of God? Or are you committed with your life to the things of God? There's a very, very big difference. Are you leaning on God? Or the minute the pressure gets turned up, you have this attitude that says, well, God, I would lean on you, but this situation is so difficult. I can't lean on something I can't see. I have to go rely on something in the physical. Man, let me remind you today. God is more real than even the things around you that you can touch and you can smell and you can taste. <laughs> Are you hoping confidently in God this morning? 
Or are you putting your hope somewhere else, maybe in a relationship or maybe in your own power or strength or your track record of having done well for a season? And I love the way this Amplified version says hopes confidently because even this translation is making the distinction between hoping and hoping confidently because some of us have a shaky, shaky form of hope. where so quickly we can go from zero to 100 back down to zero in our belief, in our faith, in our hope, in our trust, and our emotions are all over the map. And God is saying, man, have a steadfast, confident hope. Be even keeled and, and, and have a temperament that that shows that your belief is on something that's solid and let it make, make you solid. Let your hope be assured. Let that anchor be down no matter the storm, no matter the waves and the wind and the rain and how much your boat is being beaten this morning. Let your hope be sure because you're anchored in Christ Jesus. And those four areas of your life, a, a, a man's friendships and relationships and his social interactions, his recreation, his, his, his maybe fun downtime. Man, I, I just so you know, I'm, I, I pastor a church, but I love to have fun. In fact, I, I, I hate the stigma that somehow Christians are boring. And I, I, I almost live to defy that in the minds and the hearts of of, of unbelievers or in the hearts and the minds of some very uh, rigid Christians that I have met in my life because I believe God is a God of laughter and a God of, uh, of joy and a God of relationship and, and, and dare I say, fun. <laughs> and through those interactions, through that joy, through that laughter, relationships are, are, are created and solidified and, and people are encouraged. And, and so I love going to a Met game. I love playing basketball. I, I, I love uh, going to the beach and, and, and spending time on the water and, and an occasional golf game. <laughs> but how important is that compared to these other areas your marriage, your family, your wife, your children. Man, it's so important how we're living and interacting and, 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 and how we're ministering and, and, and the example we are right there in our homes. What about on the job, man? The Lord knows that in our society, you need money to, to, to live. There's nothing wrong, of course, with a, a, a nice house and a nice car, but where's the balance with all of that in our lives? What's important? What do we value? What are we doing with those assets, with that money, with the blessings that God has given us? You know, if your heart's not right, you'll be crushed underneath the blessing of God. I know many people who, who we prayed for in our church for a job after a month or a year of not having a job, they get a job and guess what? You don't see them anymore. I stopped praying that way for people. Now I pray, Lord, let your will be done in their hearts and their minds and their life. And, and Lord, if it's your timing, even a job, but let them put you first in that area of their life. What about your mission, your purpose? Jesus knew his purpose. That's why he didn't bow down. He knew his purpose. Was to honor God and live for God. Are we well-ordered men this morning? And, and, and today I want to close uh, with the story that has that uh, been very hard for me this week. It's been very, very sad for me. Uh, I've been the lead pastor of our church for nine years. My dad was the founder and pastor of that. We just celebrated our 26th, 27th anniversary. And, and so for 18 or so years before me, he was the pastor. And he passed away, many of you know. 
And uh, I was just commenting the other day. I, I said, man, you know, I know we're a small church, but I've been amazed that nine years as a lead pastor, I haven't had to, to officiate the funeral of any of our members uh, from our church. And I thought, man, that's great because it means people have been healthy in our church. It means nobody has, has been in any accidents that have caused them their lives. Uh, nobody has gone out there and done something that, that, that a consequence of it has resulted in the loss of their life. And um, I was able to say that up until about three, four days ago. We have a brother in our church that has been to every boot camp with us in the six or so years that we've been to boot camps with MDN. We have a brother in our church that's been part of our rock solid men's ministry since we started it every Tuesday night three years ago. I first met Jason when he visited our church sporadically. I soon found out that he had a very serious drug addiction and we loved him and ministered to him and encouraged him and he would come to church and do well and, and then fall off. And he would go into a program like Anchor House or Brooklyn Teen Challenge and do well for a season and, and then fall off. And as many of you know, House on the Rock Church is partnering with Brooklyn Teen Challenge in the Rockaways, Queens, while their original home founded by David Wilkerson is undergoing a major renovation. They're actually living in our house uh, in Rockaway and are a part of our church, House on the Rock Church. And so I have an awesome privilege to help pastor these men. They come to our rock solid Tuesday night ministry. We have a joint service on Friday nights with their director and pastor, Pastor Paul Burke. And on Sunday morning, they're with us. And so I've gotten to love these guys and know these guys. And Jason from our church finally went into Brooklyn Teen Challenge. He completed a year. He had more support than most in his position because the program was in his community. The program was connected to his church. He had the leaders and counselors and pastors of the program with his own pastor side by side partnering together. But sadly, a few weeks ago, Jason's wife called me and she told me Jason hasn't come home. And for three weeks, Jason didn't respond to his brothers from Rock Solid those that we consider his SEAL team. He didn't respond to his pastors. He didn't respond to his wife. He didn't respond to those from Brooklyn Teen Challenge, even his friends that, that he had. Those who invested in him, those who believed with him, those that fought for him. And sadly, three, four days ago, I got the call that Jason at about 37 years old died. And I'm filled with lots of emotions over these last few days. Disappointment is probably one of the biggest, but I'm also very frustrated and I'm very angry because this did not have to be the case for Jason. He had every tool. We went through this curriculum about three times. Jason sat in the boot camps. Jason sat in a men's group every Tuesday. Jason had SEAL team brothers. Jason had one-on-one -on -one involvement with not just one pastor, but with probably about five pastors. And the truth is brothers, Jesus could be your SEAL team brother 
Jesus could be your accountability partner. Jesus could be your pastor. But if you're not going to take and you're not going to use the tools that he has given you, then you're going to live a defeated Christian life. And maybe it won't be as drastic as dying from a drug overdose. But brothers, the sobering truth is this. Sin leads to death. And it may not be in an instant, like in the case of Jason. But if we're playing with sin and trying to walk straddling the fence it may not be quick but it's a slow death that we are experiencing even in our spirit our emotions our minds our souls our bodies our relationships our purpose and we're not the only ones affected by this our families are and Jason leaves behind a teenage daughter, a 12-year-old or so son, and a five-year-old son that asked the question yesterday, does anyone ever come back from heaven to visit? And this is what's at stake. And far greater spiritual things that are more powerful than even the physical life are at stake. And so as I conclude a summary of a summary of weapons, <laughs> I want to emphasize, and I can't do it enough, do not leave your weapon on a shelf fight the good fight of faith and take every opportunity that the enemy is trying to convince you to sin as an opportunity to with that sword win that battle and grow in that area of your life for the glory of Jesus and know that you're not alone mm -hmm. because we're here for you. MDN's here for you. These brothers are here for you. And most importantly, the Holy Spirit, God is here to fill you, to lead you, and to empower you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Wow, I know Brother Jason too. That's that's a that's a wild story right there. And I, I, I'm so sorry for you and the gang. Um very sobering. And 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 if you think about how this went full circle, we started out by talking about this curriculum, taking it, using it owning it and making it you and making it part of your life, making it part of, and I think you covered it so well when you talked about culture. And guys, within that association section, uh, there's three areas of culture. There's the culture influences your life. There's the, your life influences the culture. But I think the number one thing on the bottom, it says a man is to be the cultural architect of his life. Who are you letting architect, design, and control your life? If you're not letting the Holy Spirit, and Pastor Scott says this all the time, what you feed more, the flesh or the spirit, will determine the quality of your life. And, and it's a sad thing when you hear Brother Jason obviously gave in to the flesh and the culture. And, and so think about this. He had everything, every weapon but never made it his, never made it, never owned it and made it his to go after the enemy with. 
and the enemy knew how to mess with his mind. So that's what, that's a sad story, but it's a, it's a, it's almost like a, a full circle confirmation of, like you said, Pastor, of owning this and making it yours. So uh, again, we apologize for that. Um, well, it is a rough one to get into. Uh, I want to cover offering real brief here. Um, yeah, that hits home, man, especially when you know a brother. It really hits home. Anyway, guys, this curriculum and everything we stand for at the ministry will change around your life and change the life of another brother if they're willing to own it and they're willing to have some skin in the game. There's so many scenarios out all throughout the world where God talks about and literally lays out you having some skin in the game and he will meet you not only halfway, he'll meet you 100%, but you gotta have some skin in the game. And we thank you for this ministry. We thank you for your offering and what you do with the ministry. Brother Sonny, if you wanna put up that slide real brief. Um, guys, there are three ways to give. You could give right online, going to MDN site on the donate. You could text the word give to 833-500-4685. And if you old schoolers out there, you need to send in a check. Praise God, it's okay. Send it to the conference center at 27 Grand Farmingdale. And uh, like I said, we always talk about a budget. And the best way we can stay to a budget is if you could pray on a number that you like to give on a weekly or monthly basis, it would just help so much more when it comes to keeping a budget for the ministry. And uh, thank you, Pastor Gary, again. In the remaining few minutes, what I'd like to do is, number one, talk about a brand new series that's starting next week, and I want to let the man himself talk about it, who's going to be bringing it, who's back from a refreshed, regrouped Holy Spirit time with the Lord, and uh, let Pastor Scott come on and say hi to the men, and uh, so glad you're back. Good morning, brothers. Pastor Gary, uh, thank you for ushering in that word today. Uh, it blessed my heart. I love listening. I love listening, especially to such a talent communicator of God's word and uh, the passion. And uh, you have our sympathies also from Deb and I. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to start something wonderful. But I just want to tell you what the Lord gave me, what Pastor Gary taught me today through the word. Uh, just three things, and I'm not looking to teach, I'm just giving you three sentences uh, that I believe God wants us to know today. Number one, the battle is real. Number two, the Bible is real. It is written. And number three, the brotherhood is real. And all three of those are practical steps that you can take away from our summary today. Because if you understand in your mind and expect problems, which we're going to be talking about next week, you expect problems, then you understand to pick up your sword and not leave it on the shelf, like Pastor Gary said. And that you realize the Bible is real and powerful. It's practical. It's something you could pick up. We're going to talk about how to do that over the next few weeks, too. And to think that you can do this alone, I'm just so proud of you guys for getting on here uh, Thursday mornings when the world is either sleeping or off, pursuing, paying for their mortgage. Not a bad thing, but it shouldn't be the first thing. And uh, meaning the brotherhood is real. You jump on here and you feed, for, you feed off of God's word through the brotherhood. So th those three practical steps to the summary that Pastor Gary gave you, we want to leave you with today. And uh, Pastor Gary, uh, uh, I know there's disappointment. Uh, anytime there's loss, there is. But I believe uh, the word that came to me when you were speaking is uh, uh, there was a pat, God's hand patting you on the back and giving you a thumbs up for extending this precious man's life and giving him a few more years with his children. For those children will develop and grow to be something better because he did not have the tools to take them on any longer than he did. So God, uh, uh, God blesses you and is proud of you. Uh, that was a word uh, that we heard also. 
Uh, but I'm looking forward to seeing you men next week. Uh, I, I'm going to share something very personal, very personal uh, that I couldn't share with you because uh, I couldn't put it together. That's how painful it was. But uh, the Lord told me uh, a few years ago to pick up a certain uh, book and read it. It was uh, the book of Romans in an area that he told me to read. And of course, I didn't listen until about two months ago. So I'm going to share with you what the miraculous things that God has given me revolving our lives. Very practical and uh, very applicable. So I'm looking forward to seeing you.